Hello and welcome to Finding Genius. My name is Kyle O'Brien, uh, your co-host, and I am here today with Elina Beridi, uh, the founding partner of Revaya, uh, a growth equity fund uh, based here in Paris, France. As you may have heard, if you've watched any of the other videos, I'm an operating partner at Revaya. So full disclosure, we work together, um, but that's also, I think, what's going to make this conversation really fun. So uh, Elina, welcome to Finding Genius. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to kick things off actually with a little bit of your backstory. So I know the first time we had dinner together in New York, uh, you know, we'd met on Slack, we'd had a couple of conversations, but I didn't know your, your full background. And if I'm recalling correctly, you, you're, you're half Finnish, uh, half French, and you're either born or spent some of your childhood in the Congo. Um, so I, I want to hear a little bit about your background. Tell me about your parents. Uh, you know, what, what was your environment like growing up? Um, yeah, so you, you got some of the, the story right. Uh, so my mother is from Finland, my dad from Tunisia, I migrated to France. And so I was um, born and raised in France and did spend a bit of time in my childhood in Congo. That's where my par par parents met. Okay. So um, I think it's a pretty, like, improbable uh, <laughs> encounter. <laughs> um, but, you know, from that... Uh, um they they gave birth to 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 me and my sister and um and then my story has been uh you know i've pretty i've grown into a french person <laughs> uh, i became french actually when i turned 18 and when i was actually applying for engineering universities in france um and either you're a foreigner or you're a national so i picked um the, the national um uh, uh, you know, alternative and um, and yeah. So I was, uh, you know, good math uh, and science student. So I decided I should, you know, just keep learning that. Right. Um, I was very fascinated by the fact that you could sort of explain the world uh, by doing science. Um, so that's um, how I got a passion for it, and then that developed into uh, you know multiple things afterwards. Um, but this is my background story, and so I guess, as you know, many people from uh, different backgrounds, it gives you um, a sort of um, different angles to to see things. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, it's something that doesn't make you judgmental uh, because you understand, you know, why people react in such and such ways, and sure. uh, probably make me more understanding. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned that you were you gravitated towards math and, and science, um, and then you, you spent time at Ecole Polytechnique. So for the U.S. viewers, I don't know if I could make the comparison, but it's kind of like a, an MIT engineering type school in, that, that's very well known in, in France. And then you did your master's at Columbia in New York, uh, New York City, correct? Yeah. So can you can you tell me about the, those two experiences? Ecole Polytechnique, I know it's a very rigorous kind of math and science uh, you know, ed education, uh, and then Columbia is, um, you know, well-renowned in, in, uh, in the U S, uh, but also I would imagine a very different experience. The American university system has a, a very specific, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's known for being a very specific kind of experience and, and somewhat different from, uh, foreign, foreign university system. Go, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, your, your time at, at, at both places? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what's fascinating about the, the, the French like, higher education system is that it pushes students to um, like go really, really far in terms of what they can learn. And so the, I guess the level there is, is pretty high. Um, so that, that obviously gives you like a, a very solid, um, give me a solid, I guess, scientific background. Mm. And, but that's probably... You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you do math for the beauty of math. You do, like, you know, uh, physics for the beauty of physics. And this, the application in the business world or, you know, actual pragmatic applications is probably less important in the, um, in, in the learning. Um, and so I, the, part of the reason why I wanted to join a U.S. university was, one, I wanted to give my um, degree uh, an international visibility and to make sure, you know, people get, okay, what I got in terms of uh, background in France is that sort of uh, uh, level globally. So I think the U.S. university gives you that. And also I wanted to have more of that pragmatic approach to learning. And yeah. that's what I got at Columbia, um, being also more into oral presentations, uh, being into maybe learning 
slightly less technical stuff, but rather stuff that are, will be applicable. Um, and I think I like that. And um, and and also, you know, as um, as a European student, it gives you just um, such a, a, a great overview of what the you know the education system in the U.S. is. I remember. It sounds really basic, but our first, very first um, day of class at Columbia was, okay, now everyone, you log in LinkedIn, <laughs> you create yourself an account. So this is, you know, your, your real life starting. Yeah. So um, you have to have a LinkedIn account and that's uh, just like this. <laughs> yeah, the, the so classic very, American you know, networker. <laughs> yeah. I would never have had that info, actually at that point, but probably today it's different. Right. And so if you're, you're very math and, and science based, uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, you hear stories all the time of, of, you know, astrophysicists going into the hedge fund world or something just because they can uh, use their applied mathematics to, to create algorithms for, for trading, for example. I'm curious how you got interested on the, in the finance side. Was that related to being in New York, which, uh, you know, tends to be a capital for, for high finance or, uh, was that something that you were interested in earlier on and, and had a feeling you'd kind of pivot in that direction following your uh, more scientific studies? Yeah, I think I got to that space to like math applied to finance because for me, it felt more connected to business and reality. Mm. I went to scientific university for the love of science, but then I felt like that I was a business person. So I wanted to find something that would be applicable. So finance was like the... The direct application and then obviously new york where this you know industry is so strong um made it uh, just relevant mm. but then um i actually was lucky to meet early in my um education curriculum someone that has been a mentor um to me and that that used to be um uh, um, the head of um, ESG investing at uh, AMD, and I got after before starting to work, I did a research internship with Columbia and AMD University, and the goal of that internship was to help so one professor at Columbia and this person at AMD um, develop white papers and academic research mm -hmm. on long term financial instruments. Um, on how to um, um, reward uh, employees through capital and also on um, how to develop an international green fund. And so very early on through these people that were very mission driven in the finance space, I um, managed to connect the dots between something that's very aspirational, so how finance can actually solve a number of issues mm -hmm. um, and make, you know, capital a tool for, for good, uh, a tool for long-term shareholding, a tool for uh, rewarding employees. And, and that was during, at just at the start of the financial crisis. And I think the financial crisis just um, laid bare a number of uh, things that were not functioning in the finance industry. And, yeah, to me, doing that research work has been uh, really critical in the rest of what I would do um, because I realized very early on that you could actually use capital to do things in a responsible way and actually to solve a number of issues. Mm. Well, I saw that after university, you spent uh, time at, at Lazard, I think it was, and, and then uh, maybe perhaps your, your most foundational experience was at uh, Eurozao uh, here in, in, uh, in France. Um, can you tell me about the experience at Eurozao? Um, I think it, it's something like $25 billion of assets under management. Uh, when I last checked, they, they have a, a female CEO, which is uh, unique and also a, a, a big kind of differentiator at, at Revaya. So perhaps it had an influence on you. Can you tell me about the culture there, what you learned during your experience at Eurozao, how that may have influenced your uh, kind of uh, direction moving into starting your own fund yeah and and just before um uh diving into that um just a quick uh, um i'll just say a quick word about the experience i had just before mm -hmm. so after this research um experience i went to work for the french sovereign wealth fund okay um, so that was back in 2010 um so again during the financial crisis and at that point there were new sorts of players that were starting to popping up in the global financial uh, uh, ecosystem. 
which were the um, uh, the sovereign wealth fund, um, okay. and uh, so basically investing public money to you know do multiple things. And in France, uh, one was created um, in 20, in 2009 by um, President Sarkozy at that point. And basically, it was it was uh, public capital dedicated to support a number of industries. Um, so you know traditional industries. And it was very important also during the financial crisis because most of the private equity world was um, was frozen. Um, and that also gave me a sense of, um, of um, you know, how capital can actually create jobs, how it can support um, industries that are critical for a country's economy. Um, and that, again, you know, kept on uh, building my conviction around, you know, what you can do um, um, with with when you manage large pools of money and and then through that experience um, where I actually was uh, was working there with my co-founder Alice that I had met before at university so uh, it kept also on building that relationship um, but then uh, having you know done a few years at um, BPI France uh, the French sovereign wealth fund I decided to join Eurasio to to, to um, uh, do what I realized I like most, investing in smaller companies and that were tech. Mm -hmm. So hence connecting with my engineering background. Right. And there um, I sort of, I was looking for a challenge. I wanted to join a small team that was about to launch something. And um, I, I got lucky because I got the chance to uh, join the team that, that was launching the growth strategy at Eurasio. Um, actually, Eurasio has its roots um, uh, around the Lazard family. Um, mm. So it used to be capital coming from uh, founding families of this bank. And over time, so it used to hold a number of assets, um, very industrial assets. And then over time, it, it became a proper private equity group. Mm. And I was lucky to see some of the transformation um, that, that Eurasio has been through over the past years. Notably, under the supervision of uh, Virginie Morgan, the, the current CEO, and um, I, I was lucky to see this company that was like a private equity specialist of a sort of uh, you know small size becoming a proper like global player, mm. diversifying different strategies, um, being becoming more international, um, uh, becoming bigger in tech. So I was lucky to be part of that movement and see you know. How like the right vision at the top on uh, international um, ESG, notably, um, uh, materialized into something that's that that got really really big. And I think um, we can be proud in France or in Europe to have you know big players like that that can compete with uh, um, other global players. So so for me it was uh, very instrumental again in my career to see that. And plus I was lucky to be part of like smaller entity um, that was doing growth. And at that point, when we started that, it was in 2013, where right. basically the growth tech space in, in Europe was like non-existent. Right. Um, I remember, you know, calling my US peers and I was like, you know, there are things happening in Europe. It's interesting. Um, we'd like to, you know, look at things. And they were, they were taking the calls, but it was, you know, none of their um, priorities. And that yeah. completely changed over the past few years. So I think we were... We went, you know, early on on that market with a strong conviction and basically just realizing that we needed capital there yeah. um, because the VC funds um, uh, didn't have enough capital to keep like following, following on. And, and basically just looking at what happened on the U.S. market, we, we realized that could happen in Europe. So I was lucky to be in an entrepreneurial journey within the comfort and, and you know, with all the great resources mm. that could be provided by a large um, institutional player. I want to continue and, and talk about Revaya momentarily, um, but I think to set the stage for Revaya and the, the core vision and, and mission, uh, I'd be remiss not to discuss ESG and crossover, which are kind of the two core pillars uh, of your investment thesis and the type of companies that you invest in. So many people are probably familiar with ESG at this point, but I still think it's worthwhile covering what exactly is ESG? How would you define it? Uh, how is it different from impact investing, for example? Yeah. Um, I think it's really difficult to uh, define ESG and core, but um, I'll, I'll tell you how we look at it. Um, so, you know, coming from the conviction that, you know, with capital, you can achieve 
um, a number of uh, objectives, obviously beyond delivering financial return. And um, ESG basically like a set of um, tools and uh, and methods and and so a mindset around developing practices that are beyond just financial practices that also relate to governance that relate to basically all of your corporate actions and make sure that and so you're using ESG tool on your, or an ESG strategy to make sure that beyond your capital um, you can have an impact on, um, on on different parts of the company and make sure a company um, acts in a responsible way towards some societal and environmental issues, and um, and this you know this um, uh, theme has existed for the past like twenty years or so. Mm-hmm. It has really increased over the past few years. So we came in the ESG space from a like um do no harm so basically you would exclude you know uh alcohol um investing in you know firearms whatever and then it moved to a risk uh, mitigation approach so you would check a number of boxes to see if companies you know do not pollute and so on and treat their employees okay and now we're into another stage where there are a number of um goals around reducing our carbon impacts that we have to reach by 2030 and by 2050 if we want the increase in temperature in the world to remain in areas that we think can be manageable. And because we have all of that objectives on a global basis, and because also we're seeing that society is changing, like the uh, Gen Z generation is the biggest generation on earth. It's like 1 billion individuals that think and consume in a, in a certain way. So because of all these changes, um, companies need to take that into account to make sure they are sustainable and they can be there over the long term and go through you know, decades of changing. So that's basically the approach we take at Revaya. If uh, when you're a growth investor, you're here to provide larger pools of capital to companies that have already proven something and you're here to help them um, have a, a global uh, leadership position. So if you want to do that, so you assume that a company can grow big at some point, um, can be a leader in its space. So if you assume that, you have to assume that they can also lead by example and that they can um, you know, get to net zero ahead of the others. And, um, and so this is uh, something that we think is inherently in a, in a growth strategy. And the, so that's on, on the ESG part, um, and, and that was um, um, that's the three core of our strategy. And the, the other part of this um, uh, growth strategy is crossover. Again, if we think the companies we invest are going to be leaders over time, we have to think about um, how they finance themselves over time and how they can remain independent over the long term. And one option for that, which is great, is the um, the public markets. If um, you are able to um, grow your companies into potential IPO candidates, that's a great way for them to remain independent. That's a great way for them to attract more capital over time, um, to get some retail and uh, understanding and visibility. So these are like really, really important um, uh, journeys that a growth investor has to be um, familiar with and has to help their portfolio companies with. It doesn't mean that all of our portfolio companies will eventually IPO. It just means that you, you ha- it takes some sophistication to be able to prepare your companies for different forms of exits or financing. Right. Well, I mean, you mentioned the, the, the kind of journey of, of ESG being something that's, you know, check a few boxes to now that's a, something that's a bit more fairly sophisticated process. It, I would imagine it, it changes the diligence process internally um, and also from a kind of public perspective, everyone's trying to incorporate some facet of, of ESG into their, into their strategy. I mean, it, when I talk with, uh, with, with people casually about it, everyone's heard the term now, everyone's familiar mm-hmm. with it. Uh, it kind of borders on on buzzword in in some cases, especially in the yeah. venture community. So, can you talk about what it means to be truly prepared as an investor to, and, and committed as an investor to ESG investing? 
how does that change your perspective? How does that change your deal flow process, your due diligence process, for example? And do you imagine based on current trends that one day everyone will be to some degree an ESG investor just by you know necessity? Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, the first thing is, um, I think over time, it it's, won't be a differentiating factor. It will just be like, you know, investment as it is. You have to incorporate a number of, um, um, of other criteria beyond financial. Um, then the way each firm uh, carries it out will make the difference. And it, it, will, it will also relate to your conviction, just like, you know, there are just different investment styles when you're an investor. There are some right. people that will prefer you know, more aggressive growth, more profitability, whatever. And so we have our style in ESG, and um, um, and and that style wouldn't apply to to anybody. But basically, um, for us, it's driven by first the selection of topics that we think will be here to stay, and that are based on um, you know fundamental um, trends. So some of them are around um, you know small businesses um, digitization. So how do we um, put more technology in small businesses so they're able to thrive. And because the, the historical wave of like software has been mainly you know, geared for um, enterprise. Um, so that's one area. Uh, when we look at the financial services, we try to focus on financial services that have a purpose or a mission. That's why we focused on family finance and um, employee savings plans in, indexed on sustainable finance. Um, so, so it's um, first a certain view of the areas you think are priorities for you um, and that you think will be able to um, stay strong across cycles, notably environmental pressure and societal pressure. So that's one. Um, then I guess in terms of, um, uh, you know, your, your sign is defined by how much weight you put on such and such areas. I think at Revaya, we do put a strong emphasis on governance. Um, the, what's specific about the growth market is that um, companies who invest in have been financed by a number of um, fundraising rounds. And hence, the board is composed of uh, the succession of uh, VCs that invest in the company. And as you, as a company, as you start your growth journey, your internationalization, etc., it requires that you become, as a firm, more institutionalized. You develop, you know, multiple subsidiaries in different countries. You build up your sea level, etc. So a lot of things become more complex, and that requires your governance to to step up a bit. Um, that's why we offer at Revaya to be represented by um, an ex a person who's not an investment professional in the firm, but who's an expert, so a sea level or an executive coming from. The industry that um, our target companies want, want to you know disrupt and we select that person you know hand in hand with the management and so we make sure that beyond providing capital we do um, add value and expertise at the board and that helps also ramp up the broader governance so we do think you know for um, uh, for us to help you know um, uh, founders steer the journey in the right direction. It's the, uh, a very important step is really leveling up that governance. And then it's, you know, multiple layers of, um, of uh, support. But uh, one thing we do is um, we help our founders um, establish a sustainability roadmap. As you said, you know, everyone is pretty much familiar with the terms and what it entails, but then when it comes to picking what's the priority in your firm, is it like, do you want to work on diversity and inclusion this year? Is that like the priority or um, is there like the, this big carbon footprint that you should do so that you can um, sort of think differently about your operations? So, you know, basically work hand in hand with the, with the management team on that and help them really select the topics that are strategic and, uh, and, and put that on the table over like a multi-year time frame. Gotcha. I, I want to talk a little bit about in more depth about crossover as well. I think you did a good, uh, a good early definition, but it, it's something that admittedly when I joined, I wasn't fully familiar with uh, or familiar with the, like the, the value add of, of being a crossover investor. 
Um, I think, you know, for the past decade or so, there's been a tendency for private companies, especially early stage tech companies to stay private longer um, because of cheap capital and for those millions of other reasons. Um, so can you, can you explain to me uh, what exactly the, the value proposition is behind going public? What are the challenges associated with going public and why it would be useful to have an advisor or uh, an, an investor like Revaya to help contribute to that process and, and, and guide uh, a younger company through that journey? So um, maybe starting with the definition of, of crossover. So it starts, um, uh, this, this theme emerged from the um, hedge fund world. So hedge fund that usually invest um, uh, capital in public markets. They, um, over the past you know, 10 years or so, have started to make investments in private uh, companies, um, notably in the tech space, um, realizing that they could um, uh, you know, cherry pick those that they like best so that they get a bigger stake um, in the cap table instead of just you know, waiting for them to get public. Um, and obviously, because some hedge funds have um, grown massively, they can, as we've seen also over the recent years, they can literally do VC and growth um, investment at a scale that is unprecedented and at a scale that is much bigger than any of the other traditional private investors. Um, so that has become a new normal over the past uh, few years, although the past months have shown that it's, it's been decreasing a bit, but um, the term came from there. And um, you don't have that many private investors that um, take, you know, the um, opposite view. So taking private, um, investing private companies and then holding um, uh, to the stock for, for a number of years after it gets public. We do start to see some um, historical VC investors such as Sequoia now um, uh, putting in place specific vehicles that enables them to hold their public um, holdings over the long term. And that's, and when also you look at the numbers, um, when you look at the VC backed companies that have successfully IPO'd in the US, they delivered more value overall after they got public um, than, than before. And basically when you have a company that manages to get public, it's um, usually a company that has, you know, a very, deep addressable market that is also able to consolidate the market, et cetera. So you probably don't want to sell the IPO. So um, um, that's um, basically based on all of these um, uh, realizations that we, it was clear for us that we have to bring that understanding and that sophistication and that for um, some of our companies that, that would in the end uh, be uh, eligible IPO candidates, we need to be able to hold to our um, uh, our stake over a number of years and then be familiar on how to divest that over years. And basically being able to nurture this dialogue with um, with late stage founders. So when they get to series C, series D, when, when you are a few years ahead of an IPO, there are a number of things that you need to um, put in order. Uh, so first, you have to be very clear about you know what metrics you should reach. So what's the level of you know gross margin, cash burn, etc. What's the uh, you have to be familiar with you know the average size you're eligible for an IPO. So that's on the number side. But then on the um, uh, you know what your C level looks like, it's something that you have to prepare um, you know literally years in advance so people are ready to uh, manage the complexity of being public. And then, um, as we touched on before, on the ESG front, um, these days there are just um, such massive pools of uh, public market investors that do have very strong constraints on ESG. That if you're not like top of the of the pack in terms of sustainable practices, there are just massive pools of capitals you you won't be eligible to. So um, these are a number of areas that you have to on which you have to get ready in advance. And um, it's important that your growth investors manage to, you know, advise you about that, because if you wait for, you know, hiring your um, your bank advisor, it's probably too late. Right, yeah, as, as someone who's, you know, mostly been on the operating side at a startup, you know, the holy grail is always the exit. You know, you get your stock options, you get your equity, 
and you're thinking about, okay, when are we going to exit? Are we going to get acquired? Are we going to go public? And that, that's kind of the logical endpoint. So coming from the investor standpoint, I always imagined that, you know, that, that is kind of the holy grail. You know, you, that, that's the, the end point. The company goes public and, and uh, you know, you make your, you, 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 you take your spoils and, and you, you run. Um, so it was really fascinating for me to see uh, actually a chart that one of our colleagues posted in, in Slack not too long ago about the value accruing to companies post IPO. Uh, and that I, I can't remember the specific figure off the top of my head, but a majority of the value, for example, from Google between 2000, whatever, and today uh, was actually accrued post IPO, not during the, the, the private, um, uh, the private phase of the company. So uh, it, it, I think to most people who are less familiar with the space, it, it's, uh, it might be counterintuitive, you know, as to why you would hold on beyond that kind of exit point. Yeah. Um, but, but now that we've, you know, obviously I've, I've been kind of uh, ingrained in the Revaya strategy and, and I've had many discussions with you and, and our colleagues, uh, it, it seems to make a lot more sense. Yeah. And I think the tricky part there, but for just for any mar public market investor is that you have to be able to weather a number of cycles and navigate them yeah. um, and, you know, not become like too, um, uh, too, too, too stressed when, uh, when right. all things uh, start to go downward and hold to your you know, conviction and, um, and stick to, you know, are the metrics good? Are the fundamentals okay? And then the market can price that in multiple ways. Yeah. But yeah. Um, and also, you know, having delivered, um, uh, I think a nice multiple ahead of an IPO, if you can add, you know, a few more, um, it's, it's, um, it's also great. You can obviously take a bit of money off the table so that you do risk your investors, but then keep on um, having a bit um, invested so that, so that you get the upside. I think it makes sense. It's also important for the companies themselves. Um, it's important that, that when they reach IPO, they don't only have a cap table of sellers um, because, you know, people that have been with you for 15 years, they're not going to you know, hold on to this stuff forever. So, and your employees want to have some liquidity, your business angels, et cetera. So right. it makes sense that um, to, to, to make sure that ahead of an IPO, you replace the sellers um, by buyers. So people that are, you know, happy to stay um, and then have a longer term uh, horizon. So this is really critical um, uh, as a, as a skill set and as something to do for a founder, like make sure, have a look at your cap table. If like 80% of, you know, the people have been here for 10 years or so, you can be sure they're going to sell. So you'd rather, you know, uh, have that rotate a little bit. Yeah. Well, I want to land here on Revaya, you know, specifically, you know, specifically on the fund, your experience, uh, raising the fund, deploying the capital. I know we're kind of towards the end of, of fund one here, which was the kind of the origin story of, of Revaya. And if I'm not mistaken, that was maybe three years ago that you raised the, the fund. Uh, now there's something on the order of 14 portfolio companies, if, if I have that number correctly. Uh, so can you talk uh, about some of the highlights? What are the, you know, some of the portfolio companies that you're particularly proud of and, and excited about uh, their, their prospect for the future? And maybe in general for other kind of folks that are new to the, the investing space, you know, what, what is it like to actually raise a fund uh, and to manage a fund? Because I think these days there's a there's an idea that you can you know if you you can build an audience or you can build a brand you can you can uh, raise some capital behind that and deploy it. I feel like everyone that I have lunch with is deciding to become an angel investor. <laughs> so can you can you tell me what it's like to raise a, a fairly substantial fund? The process of actually fundraising uh, and then some of the companies that you've you've worked with thus far that you're you're particularly proud of. Yeah. Um, so yeah. First, so Revive's journey. Um, um, started like three years ago when we did the first closing of the, of the first fund, and um, and like fast forward um, uh, to today, it's um, so twelve portfolio companies plus um, we have a small um, portfolio of listed companies. Um, they represent a very small uh, single digit percentage of the fund, but uh, still that gives us this this very good understanding of public listed companies. And um, so on these twelve portfolio companies, we're obviously proud of all of them. Um, there are some that are later stage um, and that are uh, very credible IPO candidates that people may be more familiar with. Um, so I can name Algolia, which is um, uh, a search uh, platform and module basically powering 
most of the e-commerce website that we use. Um, there's Ericol that is um, a communication software as a service for um, small businesses and medium-sized enterprise. Um, and uh, basically they enable all sales people to have a very connected interface for, for voice. Um, and on the earlier stage of, um, of what we use, so slightly earlier stage, uh, we're an investor in um, a very fascinating uh, brand management platform um, in Frontify, uh, coming from a very small town in, uh, in Switzerland, St. Gallen. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that shows, you know, how we can uh, find companies um, maybe outside of, our, um, of where we are actually uh, physically based. And um, we've invested also in areas such as the healthcare space with Hublot, um, uh, France-based companies specialized in um, bringing uh, part-time workers to hospitals and clinics, which is a critical need and something that's all you know, managed by hand today. Um, and, and we're also um, involved in the family finance space, as I said before, with Go Henry, a UK player in the space. So we've, um, we've had this um, multi-sector um, uh, approach, multi-country, and, and we're very happy with the journey today. And basically, as any entrepreneurial journey, and just like outputs for the companies, we're as well in, in um, so fast-growing scale of phase uh, um, with uh, the fundraising of our second fund. So our first fund was 250 million euros, and we hope to increase that substantially for, for fund to keep doing the same thing, but with uh, more more capital to uh, keep supporting our companies. And um, also, as similarly to our portfolio, we expand our own um, geographical footprint, being based already in Paris, Berlin, um, New York and Toronto, we're going to add um, uh, soon London. And so basically to answer your question on, you know, what is it to fundraise? So First, I think it's a good exercise um, uh, for for any investor because uh, we spend our time with founders that dedicate a lot of their time to fundraising. So I think it's a good humbling exercise um, and it makes you very empathetic of what they go through. Um, so it's really important, you know, obviously having clients and that you have to serve and that you have to understand and so on. Um, then, um, as you may have heard, fundraising uh, a first-time fund is, is not easy. Um, and um, I think we took just a very pragmatic approach there, um, raising you know, as much capital as was available at a, as, at a point in time, then investing that, showing that we're delivering on the promise and that we kept growing the fund over you know the fundraising period and at the same time investing it so that we were able to show that what was on the powerpoints actually became true over time so um we basically took that very pragmatic approach um basically every single gp investment company has their own you know fundraising tips etc um i i wouldn't you know dare give any tips to anyone i was just we just tried so many things and then ended up right and the good thing of starting fund two is that you've built you know trust with your existing MPs. but that said um the biggest lesson has been you know for us say what you do uh do what you say do more than what you say actually and and that has proven um to date a good recipe for us is, is there anything about your initial investment thesis that you would uh tweak based on the the first you know three years of the fund yeah, um, there you, you, so I think the first thing is, um, and I guess that works for any sort of um, project or endeavor, it's first hold to, hold to your convictions. So there are things that have become only, you know, truer over time. So the, the need for growth capital, the need for public listing, um, understanding the need for sustainability. So we're super glad that these are like massive tailwinds and, and these are you know, strong values and connections. So that's one. Then obviously you adapt your strategy over time. Um, I'd say um, uh, we are fairly financially disciplined because we have that constant reading of the public market. So that obviously we always have on the back of our mind, what are the historical prices we do pay for such and such categories and so on. But then over time when the market you know heats up, you have to keep, you know, while the music is playing, you have to keep dancing and you have to, you know, be still be in the market, um, not lose 
too many opportunities on the back of the price. I think there are opportunities we missed on the back of the pricing that we're happy to have lost and though some that we regret, obviously. So that's where some sometimes you have to flex your discipline and, and decide up to what point you decide to flex it. Um, definitely where we need to tweak and, and that's, you know, um, my one of my personal objectives as a, one of the fundraisers of the fund is uh, um, we have to increase our check sizes because the market is growing, companies need more capital, and also the, mar- the market is good for, for them to, to, to grow and the fundamentals are, are good. So we need to, to grow that. Um, and then you have to understand also in some nascent area, I'm thinking of Web3 and so on and climate notably, which are important priorities for us. Um, you have to understand when the moment is right for you to include them in your growth strategy. Obviously, they've been around for seed fund and VC funds for a number of years, but then you have to understand when the market is right for you and your risk reward performance and your sustainability commitments. You have to understand when that moment is right. Yeah. Um, so um, it's about you know constantly reassessing the the verticals that you want to be part of and figuring out whether it's for this fund or maybe the next one. So I, I'd say the, the the for us the question has been on this whole impact category um, that you asked me again for uh, uh, already before, and um, um, it's it's. It's still nascent. Um, it's still mostly early stage fund, but we think we're going to we're going to see more of these sorts of companies that reach first stage and maturity. Great. Well, I want to close out on on a, a relatively personal note. I mean, you're you're the founding partner of one of the largest female led private equity funds, uh, at least in Europe, as far as I know, uh, and that's gotten a lot of press and I, I think uh, worthwhile press. But I'd like to know what it means to you personally and what you hope to signal to other young females in, in finance uh, looking to build a career or perhaps look up to you or aspire to uh, take a, a similar path to you and Alice, your co-founder? Um, so I think we're, we're, you know, proud to be one of the largest. And I think, you know, some got bigger, some female fund got bigger, and I'm super proud of that. And I think we're only too small. Um, so I think what... Um, um what you know any you know female investor you know male investor and whatever is just um you know you have to you have to have uh, dreams uh you have to have convictions um you have to think big and um i just want to uh, you know uh people of you know any 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 background to think that they can achieve you know what others have not um and and i think that's um uh, uh so we only need to get bigger <laughs> and more impactful great all right well i think that's all from my side elena thank you for for joining finding genius today it was a pleasure speaking with you and uh in this case i'll see you around the office uh not all of my guests uh, are also <laughs> colleagues but thanks again for joining i i really had a nice time chat. thank you okay good pleasure all right take care